Welcome everyone to System Thinking Ontario, another edition. Uh, today's topic is what systems thinkers can learn from historical synthesis. And actually, this is almost totally organized by ZAD um, with uh, Dr. Michael Bonner. Um, so I'm going to be moderating, um, and, but uh, I'll have ZAD do most of the driving in terms of uh, interviewing. Uh, to get you started off, we, we're starting off with an unusual map for System Thinking Ontario, looking back at Iran in uh, 620. Um, so um, let's do um, introductions first. We'll go around with the usual. And um, the question of the day is, how much history have you done? So Zad, if you could take us off the screen share and uh, we'll go around and have everybody say hi. Kelly, say hi. I gotta get off mute first. Hi, I'm Kelly Okamura. Uh, I am. Uh, I have a background of 25 years in, in design intelligence. So I'm coming to uh, David's Systems Changes Learning uh, Circle uh, from a change perspective. Thanks, Sang Ho. Hi everyone. Uh, my name is Sang Ho. Uh, so I'm a postdoc uh, at the University of Toronto. Uh, and I'm coming from a computer science background and uh, yeah, really excited to join and learn from the session. Thanks, Penelope. Oh, Penelope, you're on mute. Hi, I'm Penny Colville, I'm a Technoclutz, and my background is in educational technology and specifically um, educational cybernetics, and I've worked corporate and in universities, and now I'm doing my own um, learning games business. Thanks. Don. <laughs> Who's also on mute. <laughs> there we go yeah i've done a lot of things but uh, history was one of my first loves uh i studied it in, into university when um i became disgusted with the approach they were taking at the time which was to try to reduce it to uh, political economy which of course is bs because it's, <laughs> it's far far more complicated and messy than that and and anyway, I like the romance of history, to be quite blunt about it, which was my first uh, first way of getting into it. And they had no use for that. And I still am engaged in I, I I read a fair bit of history. Well, not as much as I think I do, but uh, I look at things from a historical context. Let's put it that way. Thanks, Don. Okay. Amelia? Uh, hello, my name is Nelia. Um, I am um, a lawyer. My, my, I was trained as a lawyer, but um, now I do uh, a lot of systems thinking and foresight work for the CRA. Uh, I also uh, did the SFI program uh, at OCAD uh, a few years ago, and David was one of my professors for um, for systems. Um, uh, and uh, I also have a new puppy that I just can't put down because he's so oh. cute. It's gonna if I turn off my screen, it's because like he's getting into something silly. So <laughs> okay, cute. cute. Hi, uh, I'm. My name is Ellie. Nelia invited me to come and uh, sit sit tonight with you all. Um, I'm an industrial engineer by training, and uh, I'm uh, presently. Um, uh, in financial institutions and banking, doing uh, transformation work and risk management and financial crimes. Welcome. Thanks for joining. Elena. Um, hi, um, I'm Elena Leonard. Um, my background is um, ma mainly systems and cybernetics. I actually haven't studied history in a formal sense since I was an undergrad and we read mm -hmm. Herodotus and Thucydides and Plutarch. Ah, um, yes. And then I've also... Um, mainly read other things like Joseph Tainter um, that delve into history. Uh, anyway, I'm curious to see what's next. Thanks. Kimberly? Yes, hello, so Kimberly Peter here. I also come from the SFI program, um, so some connections there. Um, I'm currently working in uh, digital design, leading the research practice in a financial services company. 
Um, my focus is largely um, sort of peripheral to that, but also outside in foresight and systems. I read as much history as I can, could read more. Um, really excited about tonight. Thanks. Griff? Hey, everybody. Good evening. I'm Griff. Uh, I've been part of Systems Thinking Ontario for a number of years. Uh, and I guess as far as like history with experience or experience uh, with history, uh, you could say that I, uh, I have an interest in the use and abuse of history for life, for purposes of life. Uh, and yeah, that's about all. So thanks very much. Thanks. Uh, Madeline. Oh, Madeline. Madeline's on mute. Okay. And the camera's not on. Okay, we'll go to Crystal. Crystal, you want to say hi? hi? Um, sorry, my, my video is not on. I'm actually on my commute leaving work. I'm an occupational therapist working in mental health. I'm also part of the SFI program. So hearing a lot of the similar thoughts and conversations that's been very fascinating for me. I took some history courses in my undergrad um, and kind of have been just mostly in conversation with people from then on and nice to be in this space. Thanks. Salman. Hi everyone, uh, Salman here. A uh, bit of a history buff and a bit of a systems buff, so the combination might work tonight. <laughs> it just might for a change. All right. <laughs> Great. Thanks. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Zad. You should introduce yourself first, Zad. Awesome. Thank you, everyone. Uh, my name is Zad Khan. Uh, I came to systems through the SFI program at OCAD University. So my instructor was Peter Jones and David Ng was a guest lecturer. So I've been involved in systems thinking Ontario uh, for a cool. while, for a number of years. And um, since that time of joining, I recall like having exposure to systems and being into, uh, from a history perspective, really seeing a lot of overlap and uh, interest between the historiography and systems, but I never really had a way to explore that. So that's what this session is. This session is an exciting, maybe different session, uh, perhaps the first in a series of what can systems thinkers learn from blank. And the first one that I'm here to kind of um, enthusiastically welcome is Dr. Michael Bonner, who's, um, I'll, I'll, I'll read a bit of his uh, background and his just a brief bio. So Dr. Michael Bonner is a Canadian political consultant and historian of Iran. He says that very modestly, I'm going to add historian of a grand sweeping number of fields, but uh, Iran is the specialty. Um, he studied classical and oriental languages in undergrad. He took a master's degree and doctorate in Iranian history from the University of Oxford. Uh, he has advised members of cabinet in both federal and provincial Canadian governments and now works at the firm Atlas Strategic Advisor. He lives in Port per Perry with his family. So welcome, Dr. Bonner. Super excited to have you here. And as you can hear from the, the bio that I just read, not only uh, are you uh, a historian, but you've also worked in actually like applied fields or seemingly in, in advisory positions in, in the government. And so kind of off the off the cuff, like what it like, yeah, how do you come to history, Dr. Bonner? And how does some of the work that you do kind of overlap with your with your field of study? Well, first I should say thanks very much for having me. It's a, it's an honor and um it's good to be, you know, talking to such a, a, a an obviously intelligent and critical group of people, um, which you don't tend to find in politics, of course, but um the uh the way I got into history is probably going to sound uh, surprising because I grew up thinking that history was nonsense. And I mean that uh, literally. My, my earliest opinion was that unless you could dig something out of the ground um, and you could actually go and verify something that, that by looking at material culture or something like that, that there was no, there was absolutely no reason whatsoever to read anything that anybody had ever written down, and that might sound, I don't know, like sort of philistine-ish or something like that. But the fact is that um, so much of contemporary um, historical debates um, could probably be uh, 
more easily settled with with a sort of older technique of uh, archaeology than a sort of endless um, debate about the meanings of of texts. Uh, and I remember there was one strange debate that cropped up when I was, I think, uh, you know, a teenager. Some I forget exactly how old I was, but the question was, you know, is Napoleon buried in Napoleon's tomb? Well, I mean. I, my reaction was, well, why don't you go check? I mean, like you're, you, you know, you could solve this pretty easily. Uh, but instead, you know, some historian wrote a 600 page book on it, which I thought, you know, what is this adage when you, think, you know? anyway, also the, what it, what it, what it calls to mind to me in retrospect is the idea of sort of formulating the right kind of question, right? When historians go and when they go about their business trying to write about the past or sort of, uh, you know, uh, uh, develop an opinion on on a historical source or something, you, know, you you really have to try very hard to sort of form the question that you want to uh, answer. And unless you get a, unless you do a good job of that, you won't really. Um, uh, you know, it won't really succeed. So questions like, you know, did Shakespeare write Shakespeare's plays or is Napoleon buried in Napoleon's? Those, I don't think those are particularly good questions for a, for a historian to be um, looking, you know, looking into. However, I did come round, uh, <laughs> obviously, but uh, uh, it was only when I encountered um, much more uh, rigorous methods of historical source criticism that um, you, I mean, many of you might reject this idea, but it certainly comes close to something that you might call scientific history, that um, you, you, you have to put much more effort into determining whether you can actually trust your source than uh, I think a lot of, um, you know, a lot of people might imagine. Having been exposed to that, it felt like a kind of natural um, transformation that I realized, well, actually, this isn't, you know, this isn't quite as silly as I thought. But the, uh, you know, comparison of his comparison of historic uh, written sources, uh, archaeology, um, you know, even in some cases, oral tradition and so forth that, you know, sort of looking at um, lo looking at uh, events or moments in history sort of from multiple perspectives and seeing how they uh, uh, inform or contradict one another. You know, that I've, I found that extraordinarily interesting. But I came to it um, ultimately through the study of language. I was originally um, a classicist, which is sort of kind of remote from Iranian history. But Iran, I Iran was the sort of the Soviet Union to the to the um, you know to to the uh, Roman Empire's NATO uh, of the uh, sort of antique world, and eventually I formed the view that if I wanted to know something about uh, Rome or the you know the world more generally at the time, that um, it would be important to look at the other great superpower of the day. And um, certainly when I was an undergrad, that was not a part of any kind of classical curriculum uh, that, that I had ever heard of. So, um, someone mentioned Herodotus and, and Thucydides, obviously the Persian empire uh, of the day sort of is constantly looming in the background of, of those two works, even in Thucydides who, barely mentions it but it's certainly there um but that was the case throughout all of antiquity right up to the to the very end and we have the date uh 620 here um round about that time you would have the iranian the, the persian empire at its absolute maximum height the roman empire is sort of getting pinned back almost to the to the to the environs of uh, the capital at Constantinople. This was definitely, you know, 
a formative experience in the history of Eurasia, a formative moment. And um, I, I just found it fascinating, couldn't resist it. So that was the field that I went into. So <clears throat> Dr. Bonner, you just said something that I think clicked in for a lot of us, which is formulating the right kind of questions. And that's really interesting from a historical perspective, mapping that to a systems thinker's perspective. Can you maybe draw that out a little bit in terms of the actual um, overview of the methods? I know you touched on like material culture or tra oral tradition, but if you were to extend that idea of asking the right questions, how does that relate to when you're working with multiple worldviews, if that is the case in a historical perspective where they have different values or belief systems or different histories and different contexts? Um, I, I asked that just so you can touch on this is that from a systems thinking perspective, we're, we're trying to always sweep those in to try to form a more comprehensive view knowing that we may, not, we may not get there. How do you relate to that concept uh, from a historical perspective or in the field of historical synthesis specifically? Yeah, well, that's, that's absolutely critical. The first most basic question you have to ask is, can you trust your source? Or even, I mean, even maybe before you get there, the basic question would be, do I have a source? Um, and then it would be, you know, can I trust it? How do I know I can trust it? Well, you know, what were the motivations of the author? Does it have one author? Does it have several? Uh, did somebody revise it at some point? Is it written with some particular bias in mind that might reflect something going on in the author's day, which he wants to sort of reflect onto a uh, um, a moment in the past because he thinks that it's relevant or something like that. Um, there are also questions, you know, when you have contradictions, as you imply, between multiple sources, which unfortunately in my field is not common, but because we have so few, but when you do have contradictions among sources, you know, you will often be forced to choose among them. Um, the, the absolute worst thing you could do would be to try to blend them all together into some new narrative or some new event um, because what you have done is you've just created another, yet another source. So uh, you will often be forced to choose um, which, you, which is the narrative you're going to follow or which is the um, piece of evidence that uh, you think is actually trustworthy. And in, in some cases, for example, Thucydides, um, Thucydides can very rarely be tested. Thucydides doesn't have any contemporaries writing um, to offer some sort of different view. Um, we have to take his word for it when he says that he, you know, he, he tells us that he, he invented speeches. He, he invented sort of dramatic uh, monologues and, and, and speeches, but we have to take his word for it when he says that they were, that the words he uses are definitely those that would have been appropriate at the time. Well, I mean, you, as I say, you, you have to take his, you have to take his word for it. Um, as for uh, Herodotus, Herodotus creates the appearance, certainly from our perspective, of being much less trustworthy. He writes about, uh, you know, large ants that dig gold out of the ground or, um, you know, strange um, uh, uh, people who find sort of like gigantic skeletons of, of uh, archaic heroes in the ground, and, um, you know, all sorts of m mysterious and, and, and seemingly miraculous things. But when you actually probe beneath the surface, uh, it often turns out that he's actually onto something. For instance, there's, he talks about uh, Ara he, he talks about the two Arabias. There's sort of a, one Arabia near what we would call Mesopotamia and another much further south. And that he he says that in, in the further uh, Arabia, there are trees that have incense, you know, incense bearing trees and, and, and winged snakes. Well, winged snakes, I mean, what is he talking about? Well, it turns out that there was um, a uh, rock formation along the old um, uh, Assyrian road that goes south. When you pass by it, there are all sorts of fossils of, uh, of uh, ancient sea animals that look like snakes, 
and that have the sort of some sort of geological formation that looks like wings there. And this is a this is a uh, uh, a kind of uh, uh, point along the road that was mentioned long before Herodotus in ancient Assyrian uh, inscriptions. So he's caught up. He, he he's captured some sort of rumor or report of a very important landmark that is somewhere far south along the way to a place like Yemen or something. So, you know, uh, we wouldn't know that unless we had been able to look at um, multiple sources from, you know, widely divergent um, uh, traditions and, and separated by, you know, at least a thousand uh, years in, in some cases. But there's often that kernel of truth there. So when you test um, Herodotus, you find it, um, and that that is. I think that may give you a little taste as to what sort of you know what uh, historiography is like. You will have to find some way of subjecting the uh, the source to the most rigorous kind of criticism that uh, that you can that you can throw at it. Uh, or conversely, if it's if you really can't do that, there's only one source. There's nothing else commenting on it. There's nothing contemporary. There's nothing else you can bring to bear on it. You're going to have to find some way of making the case why um, it, why you should trust it. Um, that's obviously going to be hard in many cases. But when you do have sources from say different traditions that have not influenced one another that are commenting or commenting on or describing the same events. And when they agree, I think, I, you know, I think most people would, would agree that you, you've hit upon the truth. Of course, that's extremely rare. And then there are also instances where you find that the source has omitted something, which you know either from some other tradition, you know, must have occurred or say that other tradition is absent, but something very obvious that common sense would suggest must have been going on at the time or would have attended the event that uh, is being described. When that sort of absence occurs and there's something that you have to infer to uh, make it make sense, you know, that's another thing. And of course, that that's the kind of uh, circumstance in which the most, uh, uh, the, the, the most uh, aggressive and, and acrimonious historical debates will occur. Mm -hmm. So some, you know, some character might fall out of a narrative or uh, some historian's explanation for what is going on uh, in the, say, the aftermath of a particular battle or something, it just kind of, you know, something appears to have fallen out or the, uh, the, the, um, death toll of some particular disaster is abnormally high or seems too low or that sort of thing, you will have to bring to bear some kind of infer inference to to try to explain it. And of course, you know, that sounds like it could, it could be fodder for a great deal of fancy or or just sort of sheer historical imagination. But unfortunately, that uh, often has to happen. I'm trying to think of a good example, um, but um, uh, something like um, in uh, in Persian history, uh, Perso Roman history, there are often sort of very violent clashes that are described in both sources, which then suddenly end in an armistice, and then it's only when it's only when you when when you look in some other uh, source, often often in uh, uh, Chinese uh, dynastic uh, histories, that you find out that there's been some nomadic migration westward, right onto the border of Iran, and the uh, the two parties have to sue for peace to deal with nomads. You know that's one where the the um, if you didn't have that source, you would have to infer something like that, or in, infer some kind of preoccupation or disaster in some in some other 
uh, in some other part of the world. But um, this, I, I would say that you're ex as a historian, you're trying to exercise both the critical the, the, the critical faculty in the same way that a lawyer or a or a, maybe a doctor or a pathologist would look at the evidence before him, as well as the sort of creative, more inferential one where you're trying to supply uh, reasons or or infer uh, causes uh, where you don't have the evidence. So I think that's really helpful in that example of where you have commissioned information and where where multiple sources are aligned, you have some form of census that you can tap into and where they don't align or when they both have omissions at the same time, you might have to make inferences. And I wanted to extend perhaps that thought. So that was a really excellent overview of some of these critical questions you're asking. In exercising those questions, I wonder if as systems thinkers, uh, even in the quote on the abstract here, we reference Russ Acoff between the difference between analytical thinking, kind of zooming in, unpacking things, breaking them apart, and synthetic thinking, kind of going up to the context and piecing them together. And you you made an allusion to that when you said that if the sources run dry, you might look to the Chinese empire and figure out that there was an armistice between the Romans and the Persians. And I wonder, is there that tension often at play between analytical and synthetic thinking in the, histori in the historian's practice? And how do you operate between these two modes? Is there a sequence? Is there a method? And, you know, but what type of, um, what does that illuminate when you have to operate between those two modes, if at all? Excellent question. I would say those two modes are absolutely essential. Um, there's no, I, I can't claim to have invented this phrase, but I don't know who did. Um, there's no synthesis without analysis and no analysis without synthesis. Um, Unfortunately, the kind of synthetic history, the sort of big history that, that looks at long and deep trends sort of playing out on, on, a, on a large scale across time and across sort of multiple, um, what you would call sort of multiple historical fields, uh, that's, that's, that's been out of favor for some time, especially in academic history. Although I think I, I think it's coming back with with um, books like Peter Frankopan's The Silk Roads, I uh, strongly recommend it. I think that that kind of history is 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 making a comeback. Um, but for a very long time, you know, from the mid twentieth century onward, people historians would be preoccupied with what I call a kind of pointillism, where you know some medieval historian. Uh, obsessively analyzes, you know, a kind of like a sort of list of provisions found in a monastery or something or like a receipt <laughs> or a, some kind of very tiny detail in a, in a manuscript or something. And, uh, you know, churns out article after article about these things. And there's sort of no sense of how it fits into anything or what, what the context is or why this would be, significant or what bearing it has on 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 really anything um conversely you might also find historians who isolate one particular artifact in, in found in some part of the world and you know construct this sort of vast and largely imaginary story connected with its significance or why it would be so important you know an, an example of that kind of thing would be something like the people who think that the stirrup you know the invention of the stirrup was just sort of the explanation for absolutely every piece of every event that that happened afterward or the the uh the invention of the heavy plow explains you know all of human history afterwards or something like that you can sort of find you can sort of wander into error in in both um directions. Um, however, uh, in, in my, in my field, I, I always wanted to, um, I, I wanted to show the history of late antique Iran in its proper context in, in the sort of scene of world history at the time. 
um, that's often interpreted to mean something like you're trying to, I don't know, like it, it's just much it, the way I the way I imply it. It's much more than than trying to, I don't know, add add diversity or or um, diff, sort of different viewpoints on Iran. That's not the point. The point is to show how it fits into what you might call a system. Iran has a geography, obviously. It has um, a language that certainly evolved over time. There was a, also a religion that was rooted there, more than one, in fact. It's sort of sandwiched between the Eurasian steppe and the um, sort of uh, desert frontage of Arabia and the sort of Mesopotamian river systems, and then onward into Rome. And then further east, you have China. So uh, obviously bearing in mind that communications were much slower and the world was, individual parts of the world were much more isolated than they are now, there still must have been some way that these uh, different uh, empires and, and sort of different uh, geographical and linguistic areas uh, fitted together. And I thought that if I could somehow explain that or put Iran in its proper context, that that, that would be some kind of contribution. So the way I thought of sort of telling that story was that Iran is sort of, it, 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 all Iranian foreign policy and its sort of vision of the world, the religious uh, vision of Zoroastrian and so forth, that is shaped by the interaction with the world of the steppe, the desert and and uh, sort of grasslands that extend practically unimpeded for you know miles and miles and miles above them, or, or between basically uh, what is now Hungary and all the way to the borders of Korea, um, and this is of course where various sort of nomadic uh, hordes and, and empires and what have you had their uh, base and Iran was practically open if you look at that map sort of the sort of northeast area Iran sort of opens up into the into the steppe um, with practically no um, borders no no natural borders and of course much the same happens in the uh, Caucasus where whereby on this sort of the, the, the Caucasus obviously has very high mountains in it, but it along the uh, coasts, you know, it's basically wide open. So um, this explains this explains why so many resources were de devoted to trying to fortify those areas. Why Iran was constantly trying to get Roman assistance to sort of keep the nomadic world at bay. It also explains why. Uh, uh, various um, uh, uh, why conflict in 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 the in the West with Rome sort of follows the the rhythm of of uh, hostility from the steppe. That whenever the steppe lands were quiet, that that was the invitation to renew warfare in the, in the West and so forth. So I think I, I still think that that's a good that's a good way of sort of approaching. Um, the history in question, uh, and this naturally led into investigating things like, well, what do the Chinese sources have to say? China kept an eye on the step two. Um, what uh, you know, and, and 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 in fact, arguably a better eye than anybody else. But the the question was, you know, how does this have any bearing? Can I bring these uh, foreign sources to bear on? The history of Iran. So that's that's what I attempted to do in in the book that was uh, just on the screen there. Um, but the question you may have in your minds is, well, why? Why was this approach necessary? The fundamental problem with uh, late antique Iranian history is that there are basically no sources, no no indigenous sources, and that's not because people didn't write things down. They certainly did. Um, it's not because they didn't take an interest in history. They, they certainly did. 
But when it comes to the viewpoint, you know, things, uh, government documents or the viewpoint of the court and the government, uh, the bureaucracy and so forth, we don't, we don't have anything. What we do have are later recyclings and translations of some sort of domestic indigenous tradition of Iranian history that, that then sort of resurface in Arabic hundreds of years later. Clearly, a lot of the indigenous Zoroastrian, that was their religion, a lot of the indigenous Zoroastrian stuff has been removed from it, um, probably because it wasn't well understood and and probably struck people as either irrelevant or weird or, or both. And there's heavy emphasis on conflict with, with Rome not really very much about what's going on in the East. And again, the fundamental question is, is any of this trustworthy? You have these Muslim historians, many of them are, I don't know what you might call them. They're not exactly historians as we would understand it. They're more like literateurs, like someone like Dinawari or Tabari, who is just up here. Tabari is kind of like a, a jurist. Uh, he, he he's mo he's famous for his long history. Um, it's a gigantic work. He uh, he supposedly he supposedly wrote forty folios a day, which is, is really an extraordinary feat. Folios, a huge piece of paper, and he apparently followed some kind of strange, very special diet so he could write and eat at the same time. He didn't have to leave his desk, but. Um, he wasn't a historian. He was more like a jurist or a theologian. And um, apart from the history that he wrote, he's most famous for a, a long sort of exegesis on the Quran. It's called the Tafsir. Um, he, uh, as I say, though, his work has embedded within it a, a, a sizable treatment of pre-Islamic Iran. But that isn't his main theme. He's including it incidentally because it's part of this sort of part of the sort of genealogy of the contemporary caliphate. And he's writing in the, uh, uh, in the 10th century, um, looking back, you know, hundreds of years in, in the past. So again, can any of this be trusted? Because without it, we don't really have a narrative of Sasanian history. Uh, late antique Iranian history. What we have are sort of scattered references, the occasional prolonged narrative, mostly about warfare from Roman history. And we have some Armenian historians who are contemporary with the events in question, who are entirely preoccupied with their own sort of local affairs, except insofar as Iranian um, except insofar as the Iranian government sort of impinged on them. So that also naturally brings in things like warfare and uh, ecclesiastical affairs. So when you look at all these sort of pieces uh, separately, they don't naturally coalesce into what you might call a system. They don't naturally form a coherent narrative of, of anything. It, it it's more like it's more like a rough chronological outline with these sort of points of events, mostly battles, mostly uh, conflict uh, in 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 the West, and no explanation as to how they're all how they should be united or made sense of um, various. Uh, Persian kings seem to just sort of wake up in the morning and go off to battle against Rome, and we don't know why. Um, so, and of course, there's nothing about any kind of bureaucratic system or finances or anything, anything like uh, anything that you would expect of, of say, a government document or some sort of indigenous, uh, indigenous. Uh, 
uh, record that, that would suggest self-image or policy or something like that. So a historian has to try to make sense of it all and sort of somehow uh, massage or torture it into a, in, into something coherent. Um, I thought that was an interesting challenge. Um, you can, if you, if you read, uh, if you read my book, you can judge for yourself whether you think it's successful or not, but, um, it certainly wasn't, uh, it certainly wasn't, uh, easy, but I thought that the framework of this sort of step, this sort of relationship between sort of Iran, Rome and the step, I thought that that was the, the sort of general, um, approach that would help to make the most uh, uh help to make the most sense of it yeah no thank you dr bonner that was a really helpful explanation about the the methods that you use uh your field uses um as specifically related to your field of study about the historical context of iran in the sasanian empire um one of the things as systems thinkers that so one of the challenges that this then brings up as systems thinkers i think everyone on this call faces that issue is one of boundary definition. We always run into that beast of a question about where to draw and define the boundary of a system. And so you were kind of explaining about when you look at uh, ancient Iran, for example, there's geography, there's language, religion, culture, political influence, et cetera. Um, at a certain point, even in your own writings, I'm sure you have to have there has to be a judgment call that I suppose is made about the type of boundary a historian is defining or working within. And I just wonder for the sake of the audience, when we think about systems boundaries and you think about historical boundaries, how does that come about? How do you draw the best or worst, I don't know, boundary around what you're trying to articulate in your work? That's a good question. Because there, there, there would also be say chronological boundaries and so forth you know when does the you know does the sasanian empire end when its last king uh, flees the capital or when he dies or when his grandson dies? you know like when when uh, that's an interesting question because his grandson uh, his his family um uh, fled after he was killed uh, and they ended up in china in uh in um chang an uh, and and persisted for quite some time there uh, maintaining a sort of court in exile so how how sasanian was that does is that part of sasanian history you know that's a, i think that's a, an interesting question and of course geographically and culturally when you look at western iran and eastern rome you have a very ill-defined border that runs north south and you have the same exactly the same groups of people on either side of it, um, the same religion, same language, uh, languages, uh, you know, who whose border is where and um, to what extent uh, are the people on either side of it, either Iranian or Roman. And, and of course, that kind of question would contribute to um, reasons for conflict also. So it's that that sort of question of boundaries is definitely worth um, considering. Um, in my more recent book, the question of what, because it is meant to be about civilization, and I wanted to have something to say about Western civilization mostly but not exclusively and i noticed that this is a topic that's now sort of come back with a vengeance i keep hearing this phrase civilization all the time which i didn't before um so what was western civilization well does it have some kind of chronological or geographic um border to it well I wanted to at least suggest, you know, I don't, I don't know how you can, you can judge for yourself how successfully I may or may not have proved it, but I wanted to suggest that this, you know, the event that we call the, the Renaissance is actually a kind of epiphenomenon of developments that began 
far away and long before that in um, the the Abbasid translation movement centered in uh, on um, eighth and ninth century Baghdad. Why? Because that is the rediscovery of not not necessarily rediscovery, but certainly the the uh, um, reappearance, the sort of revisiting of uh, Greco Roman um, philosophical and scientific texts. And it sort of has a, as I, as I try to describe it, it has a kind of knock-on effect where sort of various other people are imitating this and that the, the Italian Renaissance comes at the end of it through things like Charlemagne's um, uh, attempt to sort of uh, organize and, 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 and codify uh, uh, classical learning and Alfred the Great and the sort of Byzantine, uh, what's called the the uh, Byzantine uh, Macedonian Renaissance, and if you think of it, this is really you you can think of it as one phenomenon, in the same way as say a group of modern scholars spread out all over the world are uh, affected by and wish to imitate events that occur in one university far off. And then it sort of spreads, you know, when you have a sort of single school of thought or 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 a single sort of technique that spreads all over the world, that that's one phenomenon, not multiple unrelated things that just sort of coincidentally occur. And the fact that they're separated in time in the past, you know, by many centuries, um, I, I, that I think that that's more of like an artifact or a kind of epiphenomenon of the way we see history that Charlemagne's uh, approach to classical learning had deep roots. It must have had deep roots because these things just don't come out of nowhere. But we see only the sort of tip. We, we see only the, the, the tip of the iceberg. We don't see the, the, uh, the, the longer development. Um, and we don't see its more distant uh, impetus in uh, Arabic letters. But I think that we have to infer this. We have to infer this sort of thing and see uh, 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 see a, a system of the of the transmission of uh, technique, attitude, and um, revival of uh, of interest in philosophy and so forth. So. Um, I don't know how persuasive you find that, but I think that it looking at these sort of seemingly disparate events as one phenomenon, it suggests a couple of different things. One of which is that Western civilization should not be uh, closed off from uh, influences that we might think are, I don't know, foreign to it because the Baghdad translation movement wasn't foreign to it. It was in fact the impetus for, for what you would call the sort of regrowth. And, you know, think of th there are other erroneous ways I think you can think of it that should be debunked. It, it wasn't an exclusively um, Muslim movement. There were all sorts of different people uh, involved in it. Uh, and that, that, that sort of uh, openness and cooperation amongst different sorts of people made the Middle Ages um, anything but the era of sort of rigid dogmatism and narrow-minded um, uh, uh, orthodoxy and that sort of thing. It was actually, um, from my perspective, uh, a, a period of really extraordinary academic and intellectual uh, freedom that um, may not have been paralleled uh, since then, uh, when you consider the resources that were that were available then and which are available to us now we should be capable of far greater feats but we aren't at least not yet um so uh, i think that that's an example of how sort of widening the the border or or sort of expanding where you draw the line um 
is actually beneficial. It helps you helps you see things, I think, more clearly, or at least I, I thought so. Uh, and you know, one could push it even further back. You could say, well, the Baghdad movement is actually only the latest one of several thousand years of uh, Mesopotamian rulers building their own libraries and hiring scholars to do things. Um, so, you know, maybe there's some merit in in looking at that sort of thing too and and seeing the sort of um a much more distant or sort of uh very ancient germ of of, of uh, uh, sort of royal patronage of learning that would eventually flourish uh, you know through multiple uh, uh cultures and so forth and, and and eventually resurface in 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 europe but again I think we can choose how we look at these things, where we draw the line, we eventually have to stop somewhere. We also have to choose where we're going to start. Um, but, um, you know, you can, I think you can get a lot out of sort of shifting those, those uh, borders around or, or uh, expanding them and, and, uh, and, and, uh, you know, looking sort of, I don't know what the right metaphor is looking from, you know, high up from, from the sort of 30,000 feet uh, mm. view and seeing and 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 seeing the sort of time horizon on a much on a on a on a on a much greater scale. Yeah, I think I think that response, especially your choice of the time variable being almost like a collapsing of time or blurring of time, especially from the human experience, allows you to redefine the borders in a lot of more interesting ways. Um, and I think that question might come up in the Q&A, that's for sure. I know that relates to some folks' uh, areas of study. Um, but I think I think one of the, I just know, you know, there's a couple more questions to get in before we open it up. And I want to give you a chance maybe to extend what we chatted about in terms of asking critical questions, uh, being between different modes. Um, as a result of that, you're playing with boundaries to 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 pursue lines of inquiry that may not be readily apparent. A certain point comes in your work, and perhaps this is your second book, where you are actually making a net contribution. You're 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 adding a narrative of your own, and in your latest book, you arrive at three key themes in in defense of civilization. So maybe I just want to give you the chance to share this part of the historian's work, where they extend from the source documents and their analysis of it to actually adding a net a narrative contribution to it. And maybe you can explain those three themes briefly and how you arrived at those three. Yes. Okay. So this is an example of me sort of reverting to my teenage self and casting aside biases and, uh, you know, flimsy historical sources and looking again at, at archaeology and, and art history. Because I thought that I would be on firmer ground trying to identify what it is that um what civilization is or, or 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 how it manifests itself by looking at things that people actually made rather than things that people said about them um so the the three um principles if you like the three principles of clarity beauty and order i felt that i needed those in order to have some kind of framework to discuss the um uh, to, to discuss art history uh, and um material culture and to a certain extent literature uh through you know multiple millennia of, of history otherwise i think that the the information would sort of get out of control and become sort of unwieldy again you can debate whether this was successful or not, but you know Normally, normally, sort of boiling things down to three principles that tends to work. I think I don't exactly know why, but it, it tends to uh, three three criteria seem to seem to work well. I derive those from looking at the contrast between the art of the Upper Paleolithic period before people were living in settled communities, sort of cave paintings and so forth, with what came after. And 
it's not just a question of what is sort of attractive or not. These paintings are very attractive. I mean, they're, you could you could hang this on your wall and it would be a, a you know very impressive uh, work of art. All the more so for being old. There was cave art. There was um, music. There there are flutes that have been discovered. There were obviously clothing. There was some sense of social cooperation because people went hunting together. There must have been um, some sense of you know uh, when to hunt and how and watching the seasons and so forth and yet there was no civilization this comes later sort of at the end of the ice age and then material culture changes and if you look at the art of say very early dynastic egypt it looks as though everything has sort of reached maturity that the sort of earlier um, uh, forms and shapes and trends have sort of solidified and, and uh, as I say, reached maturity. Looking at this, I see clarity, beauty, and order. Clarity, the world is intelligible. It can be explained and described through language, through, through um, visual representation of, of language in, in hieroglyphics, which are, which are not just um, representations of sound, but they're also images. I think that's very, they're very critical. Beauty, in English, we don't really have a good word for this. When I use the word beauty, I'm not referring to things that are simply attractive to us, but that they are, they are harmonious and proportional. You think of the way Pythagoras um, liked describing the world through um, ratios and mathematical proportions. He saw um, music like that, as well as visual art. That's what I mean by beauty. And the earliest, the earliest civilized art is always following canons of proportion um, and harmonious uh, ratios of of uh, uh, of, of figures depicted. And finally, order, you have the idea of a, of a kind of natural order, natural organization to the world, to the universe that um, um, human beings fit into. And in the human realm, uh, political organization, uh, social organization is a sort of reflection of that. And um, in the sort of uh, metaphysical realm, we call this religion, or uh, the sort of the, the idea that there's a, a, a an order that you cannot see, but nevertheless um, real. So I trace, I, I use these uh, principles to sort of organize the the information that that I present in the book. Each one of them gets a chapter, and um, I show how. It, our our expression of these principles in mostly in art history and and um, material culture, but also a little bit in literature, have sort of changed over time, and how uh, certainly in the twentieth century they deteriorated, and I interpret that as a sign of decline, and the the sort of um, if you want a, a good example of what I mean here, you can look at modern art. Now, my criticism of modern art is not, it has nothing to do with whether or not it's ugly or because that's obviously a matter of taste or whether it um, somehow represents a degeneration from a, a more accurate depiction of the world. No, that's not what I'm saying. The modern artists themselves, people like Kandinsky or Picasso and so forth, they, they were extremely sensitive to developments in um, uh, cutting edge physics at the time. They were fascinated by um, things like the Bohr-Rutherford model of the atom and by Einstein's um, theories of general and, and, and special relativity. And what they took from these things is that they 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 determined that the universe was unintelligible, incoherent, chaotic, random, 
and sought out to depict it accordingly. And, you know, we can debate whether that's actually true or not. And certainly I would argue that their understanding of physics was actually deficient, that they, you know, people always want to run a little bit too far with uh, Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. Like it doesn't really mean what they think it means. But the, but the fact is that they found what they thought they were looking for and depicted a chaotic and, and sort of um, unintelligible world. And this is very different from the way our ancient ancestors would have looked at things. And it, it actually brings, it actually brings um, material culture much closer to what it was like in the upper Paleolithic. You think of those um, images of, of animals sort of rushing forward, superimposed upon one another, this sort of um, depiction of violent energy and, and, and sort of directionless movement and so forth that there's, you know, I don't want to push that too far, but I think that there's there's something there. And when you think about the art of the futurists, the the futurist movement, um, it's all it's all sort of really sort of tense, um, violent movement forward, and and sort of a love of speed and 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 uh, uh, strength and 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 so forth. Um, so very very different from from what the earliest um, civilized art was like, and uh, and and certainly when you think of what was happening at the time when this art was produced, the first and second world wars, you know, it's very hard, I think, to consider it to be an expression of a civilizing impulse. That it's it's really something quite different, and it 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 represents a, a kind of um, uh, deterioration, if not something close to a collapse in in um, uh, human attitudes to what it means to be uh, civilized and, and and human so um I don't want to I don't want to spoil the rest of the book if someone feels inclined to read it but that's that's the basic um, that's the basic idea but of course to get back to the original question I don't think that this would have made sense without those, three criteria to sort of order and 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 um organize the the information so i mean people could quibble about those three things you know should i have chosen some other word or you know, but having having those principles to organize it i think was helpful and those are clarity beauty and order correct correct, correct. awesome um, I know I've been asking you a bunch of questions and I still have more to go, but because, you know, Systems Thinking Ontario, you know, we try to bring in uh, other voices and some conversations. David, do we want to let others hop in here? And if I have any follow-ups, I can, I can queue up as well. Yeah, sure. Um, so uh, I'll welcome people to uh, put their questions in the chat or you can stick your hand up, but I'll kick one off because... Um, as you're talking about the fall of the Roman Empire um, and the Byzantine Empire that arises after it, uh, this reminds me of uh, the work in the systems community. Uh, Timothy Allen had done work with uh, Joseph Tainter. Um, and so Joseph Tainter had said uh, that, in effect, he's defining complexity as part of modern society or uh, the, the rise of society and complexity. Um, but then the uh, the answer came, well, after the fall of the Roman Empire, the Byzantine Empire lasted a lot longer and it was sustainable. So mm. um, a, a question I would ask is, um, and I'm not sure how familiar you are with that definition of complexity, but you know, are today, are we anywhere near a socio-political collapse or what simple or what, what can we learn from history about that? Excellent question. So the archetypal collapse is something like Rome, I guess, but the the absolute worst one ever, I think that we know about not not just that we know about, but that we know the most about is the bronze, the late Bronze Age collapse. When you have not just one polity like Western Rome collapse, but you have an entire world system go down basically all in all in one go. And 
the the latest word on the collapse of the Bronze Age is that it was a sort of perfect storm. There 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 were plagues, invasions. There were uh, sort of uh, climactic uh, shifts, um, uh, breakdowns in trade, warfare. You name it. But the collapse was total, um, and and particularly bad in um, the area that we now call Greece. It was so bad that um, all of the stuff that we would associate with the idea of complexity, right down to you know, the organization of states and even writing completely disappeared and had to be reintroduced um, some, some um, you know, 800 years later. So um, the lesson from that, to put it as, um, I guess, simply as possible, is that the collapse was so total because the world was so closely integrated. It was the first, if you like, it was the first age of globalization um, in the sense that you have these disparate uh, dynasties in Egypt and, and uh, um, uh, uh, Hittites. Hittites, yes, sorry. It's on the tip of my tongue. Um, Egyptians, Hittites, you have the Ugarit, you know, they're all very tightly related to one another. They correspond um, uh, all the time. We still have a lot of their correspondence uh, on, on tablets. We have also the um, uh, trade networks are so carefully um uh, set up that you know the exact amount of the uh, the pr precise ingredients to make bronze are are being shifted around um and and whatever is missing in one area is being brought in in exactly the right uh, proportions and quantities and so forth so um you know on a somewhat smaller scale much the same kind of thing that we have nowadays although we don't depend you know, so greatly on bronze, we have other things, but it's the same kind of principle that you're, you're carefully, carefully integrated just in time, uh, carefully integrated trade networks with just in time uh, delivery. So that whole system went down all in one go because it was fragile. It was, it was, it was good enough to meet the needs of, of, of the day for quite some time. But it couldn't withstand the 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 stress that came upon it. There, it probably you might say it lacked redundancy, and it was too reliant on one particular um, thing, bronze. So, you know, the again the lesson for us would be we would want to build in more redundancy than we have. We certainly saw the, the the negative effects of that in COVID, when all of a sudden there were shortages, you know, quite quite suddenly, because we had been making a lot of our stuff in China, and um, you know, my I, I was working in the government at that time, and you know, the, the 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 first order of business was to try to set up a lot, try, try to try to get as much of the stuff that we made in China sort of out, and and you know, make as much as we possibly could either here in Ontario or in some other neighboring uh, place. And, you know, um, it's just surprising that this wasn't thought of before, but this is exactly the kind of thing that people don't think about uh, for, for some particular reason. So are we near a collapse? Um, yes and no. Part of what I wanted to say in this, in, in my, um, in, in the in the book the defense of civilization is that collapse is always an option there, there's there's no civilization or society that hasn't collapsed if 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 uh you know if if there were no collapses there would still be a sumeria or there would still be uh the you know the third dynasty of ur but we don't or, or the egyptian old kingdom but given enough time everything um, disintegrates and there's that you know there's that uh, famous opening line to the 
um, Chinese uh, romance of the three kingdoms. You know, when, when the empire is long um, divided, it must unite, and long united, it must divide. And that, that's a truism of history. Right? Um, it's only in our time, <clears throat> I would say, that especially or perhaps exclusively in the West, that we have come to think of ourselves as sort of on a kind of historical trajectory towards a sort of specific goal. That's the sort of doctrine of progress, whether, whether you think of it as technological or um, uh, moral, or in the case of Francis Fukuyama as sort of tending toward a specific kind of social so socio-political order. Um, I, I, that's a kind of new way of thinking. Uh, I'm not sure if there, there's really much merit to it, but it's certainly popular and, and, and prevalent. And um, I, I, I wanted to show that this is probably not a very good way of thinking, if, especially if you're absolutely convinced that there's nothing that... Uh, um, there's nothing that can sort of impede the the sort of continuous progress of 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 your civilization, or that there's nothing that could possibly bring it down. And of course, the message of Fukuyama's famous book that basically everybody missed was that he argues that the um, liberal, you know, contemporary liberalism actually contains the seeds of its own destruction, and that if it's going to be successful, that these sort of internal problems that that undermine it have to be managed and 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 kept uh, at bay. And sort of his vision of the end of history was one of not not sort of continued success and 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 uh, um, you know sort of uh, exuberance, but rather boredom and 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 dullness. And that the enemies of the system would would be within because they would have nothing to struggle against except the system. So, uh, you know, people didn't read their Fukuyama carefully enough, but um, uh, especially also the last chapter where he talks about Donald Trump, everybody missed that. But um, maybe they, you know, maybe it would have been better if they paid attention. The, uh, the idea that there's just this sort of endless trajectory and that we've sort of got everything settled and figured out, you know, everybody believed that before every collapse that has ever happened. So we shouldn't try to persuade ourselves that we are immune from that. Uh, but is it actually imminent? You know, I'm, that I'm not convinced of. I'm not convinced that it's sort of round the corner unless, you know, something really quite, quite remarkable um, happens. But it's hard, I think, um, I think I think that we have to separate the idea of like the very, very evident technological advancement and progress um, from moral progress, and also from a sort of healthy you know the health of society, and also from the sort of integrity of our civilization. Now. I think though those are all not necessarily related. Um, you think about the two sort of two great examples of of of, of evil from the twentieth century: the the Nazis and the Soviets. They were certainly technologically proficient, um, and, and they had a kind of vision of of, of a sort of future utopia. Where mankind would be perfected, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't call them either civilized or um, um, I would not associate them with moral progress. Right? Those are two extreme examples. But you know, the fact that we have nice computers, or that we are all talking to each other on this sort of video screen, that doesn't make us morally good. We might be morally good, but not because of this. Um, so. Um, I say that because the view that they all go hand in hand um, is an old one. It's uh, very much associated with early 20th century progressive movements. And I think that a lot of people still believe in. Um, I used to hear growing up 
that um, you know, if only we could get a laptop to every child in Africa, we would solve you know every problem. You know, and that's that's nonsense. But but people used to talk that way. They talk that way less now, but uh, they they it hasn't gone entirely extinct. And of course, if we remember the way people used to talk about the internet in the '90s, the internet was supposed to usher in the information age. No one, I mean, I don't know when the last time anybody said information age, but we don't really hear it very much anymore. It was, and the information age was also supposed to be an age of progress and sort of uh, um, you know, greater understanding amongst all people, harmony, cooperation. Well, I don't really see very much of that now. I see a lot of internet, like the internet is sort of everywhere. It's omnipresent. It's involved in our lives more than I think anybody ever imagined in the 90s. But um, the, the, the harmonious world and the, the sort of um, ever closer um, human cooperation, so that's not really there. Um, and, and probably because people realized when they got closer that they um, still had a lot of differences or you know differences of opinion and so forth. And of course, this hasn't ushered in necessarily in a time of conflict and so forth, but um, but uh, the promise that technology would bring about this harmonious age, I think has has just simply uh, simply failed and it was wrong to um, believe it in, in the first place. But this this brings up the idea again of civilization and what I mean by it. Civilization is not associated with any kind of um, uh, economic system or what Marxists call a mode of production. But there is still a school of thought that would that would like to believe that it is. The old idea, we used to talk about the agricultural revolution. That's uh, an idea that comes out of um, Marxist um, anthropology, that the necessity for farming um, or the, the uh, you know, people decided that they were going to farm, they had to settle down to do it, and then all of the other amenities of civilization, you know, art, government, all that stuff sort of comes out of that. And that isn't true. The, the archaeological record refutes it. Um, and we know much more about it now than we did in the in the early to mid 20th century. But people actually settled down before they started farming. There's a considerable gap uh, between the two. It comes, um, settled life begins right after the Ice Age. And that raises an important question as to why. Well, what was it that persuaded our ancestors to settle down after so uh, 40,000 years of uh, hunting and gathering in the Ice Age? Well, I don't have an answer to that question, but I, it's necessary to observe that that's the case, that contrary to what Marxists say, that it was actually a set of ideas and an, a change of outlook that persuaded people to settle down, not some kind of material uh, economic uh, change. So. That implies, or it doesn't just imply it, 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 it shows, I think, quite clearly that when we talk about the things that we associate with civilized life, that they all depend on very basic things like stability, um, a sense of rootedness, a sense that people belong in a particular place and have a sense of where they are in time, which is why the earliest um, the, the earliest sort of civilized material culture expresses this idea that people have history. There was a point at which we discovered that we had history, and it's represented by things like the cult of ancestors or the, the um, um, sort of maintaining um, identical houses over the course of millennia that uh, people would build their house and then a generation later they would tear it down, rebuild it exactly as it was and do that and repeat it over the course of, uh, uh, in some cases, almost a millennium. 
this is an idea that there's please I, I just like to get some more um more people in the discussion so uh song ho had actually sent something uh, was this uh did you want to um come and ask a question uh sure yeah uh, yeah thank you for thank you uh um so yeah i guess oh for, for context i guess i should first uh, provide context so uh my research is in uh human computer interaction where uh, I, I do a lot of these like system building uh like interactive systems where you know people can use it and uh you know so uh from from that point of view i guess you know i've always been a bit, i've always wanted to build like a system where you know people can Kind of explore the history like you know in a flexible manner and so you can imagine like you know these kind of uh, interactive systems you might find in i guess museum or something right um but i, I guess like um having said that i guess my question was um like i was wondering you know, if there has been any attempt to uh, extract these larger patterns like and you said like for instance like narratives right uh which might be having a similar structure to them you know in a way um and then kind of visualize them, right? And um, and and you know, I, I think we we always talk about these recurring themes, like such as war or things that happened, you know, again and again over the course of history. So I, I'm I'm familiar with you know how we ver ver verbally you know discuss them, but you know, I'm not sure I've I've seen been seen you know these kind of visual representation or interactive system, you know, that might show you know these recurring. Uh, historical events uh, or patterns and like narratives, right? So, um, and I guess I understand that this might be very specific to like kind of system-ish uh, kind of thing. So I guess another way um, to ask this might be, you know, like, I'm, I'm curious, you know, how historians, so when you talked about, you know, uh, when you have multiple sources and narratives, right? Uh, historians have to kind of select, you know, the source that they believe is the right one. Um, so in the process, you have to compare them and you know, select it and then like synthesize as well, right? Mm. Um, I, I wonder how, what that kind of looks like. You know, is it like, do they have like a table and, you know, do they just put in these like, you know, different sources and, and then try to compare and contrast uh, and then try to select the one or, you know, I guess that might be one Kind of type of representations that they rely on to you know compare and contrast these patterns or something i don't know really good question the 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 gold standard of this sort of mm -hmm. thing was the the guy i'm not going to remember his name but the guy who did the source criticism of the four gospels mm -hmm. and he had mm -hmm. cue cards and he mm -hmm. wrote down on all the he, he went through each gospel and he wrote down all the sayings attributed to Jesus, each on a, a cue card. Mm. And then all the ones that were the same, he put in a pile mm. on mm. one side. And then mm. that left some that were unique. Mm. And he had to infer, mm. he, he had to infer um, that those that all sort of were repeated throughout the gospels that they that those those gospels um must have shared a source but then there was one that was unique mm -hmm. so he said there had to be another one and i think that's actually a very convincing idea that mm -hmm. um he uh identified uh, this sort of mysterious thing that he had to infer was there but there was no other evidence of it, apart from the fact that there was a, a unique strand um, within within one gospel that was that was not reflected in the others. So he's discovered who knows what it was. It could have been a collection of sayings or some sort of other narrative that was uh, then excerpted, and you know that's something that scholars can debate. Um, I have never done anything quite like that with with cue cards and shoe boxes. But um, you know, when when you're looking at what is held in common by source, you know, held in common by multiple sources, something like that method um, mm -hmm. is 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 useful. 
Um, and then the question comes down to, well, what is, you know, what is the nature of what you have identified that doesn't fit in with the other things? And, you know, that could be, um, you know, you could have quite a lot of fun with trying to explain um, what that is. But when you're looking at, say, constructing your own narrative out of sort of disparate facts, um, you have to start with chronology. Uh, otherwise, you won't be able to fit everything together, right? Which means that you have to find some source. It could be something very simple like um, coins that show regnal years of, of kings or something. You have, but whatever it is that you you whatever it is that you find uh, and use, that sort of chronological skeleton uh, must be there before you start fitting in the, the disparate facts, otherwise it will get out of control. And of course you can debate as scholars do, you know, the, the dates of events, but um, unless you can develop your own sort of coherent system of how it all fits together, it won't be, uh, um, it, it won't be a very cogent narrative. Thank you, thank you. Um, Zad, you want to um, return on to your next question? Sure. If if maybe we'll just do one last pass. If 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 Penny, Elena, Don, anyone else wants, to, if anyone else has any questions, Kelly, Elena does. Elena. Yeah, I was wondering if you could speak a little about the relationship of myth to history where, as I understand it, mythology is trying to essentially synthesize or maybe distill lessons uh, for general use. And the actual facts behind them are, you know, if not impossible, pretty sketchy. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, the, again, the high, the high watermark for that would be something like the Bronze Age Collapse which I believe is the ultimate origin of all the myths out there about a high civilization that comes crashing down. Things like Atlantis, um, the Norse myth of Ragnarok, or um, even the, the Zoroastrian and um, uh, Jewish and ultimately Christian and, and Islamic vision of a sort of cycle to to time and a sort of progression toward a, um, a, a future uh, a future age sort of beyond the present one that if you only had those myths before you and of course there's the Sumerian story of the flood uh, as well there's Noah's Ark and all the rest of it if you only had those stories you would want to infer, I think, that there was some kind of historical basis, some kind of historical inspiration for them, not only because they are so common, practically universal throughout many cultures, but also because there seems to be something that accords with our own experience of, of human uh, order, even if we've not experienced something as catastrophic as say the Bronze Age collapse. But when the Bronze Age collapse was discovered or evidence, when evidence of it was discovered through archeology, span a lot of those myths suddenly began to make a, a different kind of sense. And that of course, the myths often lack sort of specificity about time and place and persons and so forth. But as you say, they seem to be communicating some kind of lesson. And in the case of these collapse stories, the lesson is that um, our civilizations are fragile, but they are also capable of regeneration. And that the end of the story is not that there's just this huge collapse and everything is awful from then on, but that slowly everything comes back. And um, with this sort of thing in mind, and bearing, and also thinking about a writer like Herodotus or 
some other very ancient texts that seemed to be sort of more on the mythological side of things that I think that we should be open to the idea that there's at least a kernel of truth in them and that the lesson, the lessons that they communicate will always be um, useful for us. If they were useful for our ancestors, they must still be useful for us. We are still fundamentally the same sorts of people. We are anatomically modern people and have been, you know, for you know, when I was when I was a boy, the figure was eighty thousand years. Now, now uh, anthropologists think it's three hundred thousand years. So, if we have the same brains, the same bodies, the same sort of um, cognitive faculties as our ancestors did three hundred thousand years ago, what they thought was relevant for them and what they thought communicated lessons, probably still relevant, and there's probably still um, a kernel of truth uh, that we might be able to find. Penny looks like she has a question. I read Franco Pan's Silk Roads and um, enjoyed it as a history. He seemed very optimistic about the immediate future of that part of the world. Are you? About Central Asia? And well, am I optimistic as, well, that's a very good question. I'm not as optimistic as he is and certainly nowhere near as optimistic as he is about China. I'm not optimistic <laughs> about China. And of course that was written at a time when um, the sort of upward trajectory of China seemed um, inexorable and um, that the Belt and Road Initiative seemed to be, I don't know, a good idea. It doesn't seem like a good idea now. Um, and, you know, you have the sort of, like China, China is arguably the sort of layman brothers on steroids uh, to to uh, an almost unimaginable degree, and and um, other parallels would be the J the Japanese property bubble. I think in the eighties or nineties, uh, I have to double check the dates there. But I mean, where it's headed is not good, um, and very obviously at this point, um, I, I I'm not really very bullish on on China. However. There are hints that um, many places in Central Asia are um, of great importance and strategic significance. Um, Kazakhstan appears in the news a lot. Um, if Kazakhstan wanted to make a great deal of trouble for Russia, for instance, it could do that. Um, it may um, uh, it may do that soon. Um, but is this really going to be a kind of center of a of a sort of great Eurasian uh, empire between you know Beijing and Moscow? I don't really think so uh, anymore. And I there's a, there's an extent to which I I never found it entirely persuasive. But nevertheless, there there are still I mean. Uh, a huge amount of fertilizer comes out of Kazakhstan, I believe. There, there are minerals and uh, rare earth, I believe. So it, 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 I think that it will increase in importance. But um, their principal challenge in that part of the world, uh, I'm pretty sure, is always going to be geography. It's going to be hard to get things in and out of there hard to sort of link it up with the, with the rest of the world. And if if Russia continues this sort of descent into madness and, and instability, um, it's going to make that part of the world really um, uh, unstable. And, it, you know, if China, if, if China declines slowly or if it falls apart, um, spectacularly or something in between 
uh, or Iran is right there too. You know, Iran is not exactly a model of uh, of uh, you know good government and stability. You know, there 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 will be significant problems there. Um, now that I could be wrong, like things could sort of settle down, or there there could be um, soft landings, as they say. Um, but there will still be Im important strategic and I think, um, you know, ge geostrategic and um, economic uh, concerns there. And, um, you know, places like Kazakhstan have um, much better demographics than, than um, a lot of their neighbors, certainly than Russia and China. There could be a, an interesting population boom um their you know their tradition of having been involved in soviet technology and so forth suggests a well educated um population so they will i think that they will count for more but i you know it's i i'm not sure that they will be at the sort of center of a huge eurasian empire thank you um i wanted to say i'm really enjoying your 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 metaphors your comparisons especially um Persia, Persia was to the Roman Empire what Russia is to NATO. <laughs> Things like that. Thank you. Thanks. Don has his hand up. Don. Okay, I'm unmuted. Yeah, I made a number. I really was impressed with it. It was what you know the depth of your understanding, the breadth of your understanding of a lot of these issues. And how how your research has contributed to that and continues to, to contribute to uh, uh, the whole body of, of history in the twenty first century. At the same time, I, I was I had a number of of questions that arose that that um, made me uh, look at certain analogies, perhaps that I had from time to time looked at to to use to to understand what I think is happening in the world, and I would like to hear your opinion on some of these. Um, one of them is, uh, this is a strange one, but uh, if you look at the geological history <laughs> of the planet, you'll notice that the um, the continents tend to go and at some certain times, they, they're at right, right now, moving further apart, right? Splitting off from one great big one at one time. But then they usually reverse that for all kinds of uh, geological and physical reasons and start moving back together. But neither situation is particularly ideal uh, from the point of view of just about every living or non-living entity. Uh, so they, they are, it's never a stable thing. It's constantly moving one way or the other. And I'm wondering if that's a way of looking at a lot of the historical events, especially when you're looking at empires and uh, large coalitions. Um, one thing I, I had always thought, and you can disagree with me on this one, but it's how I saw it and how my, some of my teachers saw it, that the modern artists uh, in, their, um, in their somewhat, I suppose, more chaotic and disorganized approach to a lot of things, nevertheless, were coming up with a new aesthetic that helped us understand that we were undergoing some major shifts in the way our civilization worked, either you know morally, intellectually, and spiritually, or technologically, uh, and 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 what we have to rely on to produce the kind of world we we've now created. Um, the third one is an observation I remember that McLuhan made a long time ago, one of your uh, predecessors at the University of Toronto. <laughs> Uh, that any vast change in the media landscape, and we certainly are seeing that now, all but destroys the civilizations that it's introduced to. And he had oh. some reasons for that, a lot of good ones, um, though they were very general, which made him a suspect by the specialists. Um, but I always thought there was something to it. Another one is, the role of science, which is a whole new way of creating a civilization, is it not? It's not the same as, well, using mythology or using uh, the arts or using craftsmanship or using, um, I suppose, basic rudimentary technologies. And I'm wondering if that is going to make a change. Also, 
Uh, are you familiar with the theories in that book, The Dawn of Everything, that came out a few years ago? I am. I am. Yeah, I figured you might be. Uh, they seem to think that things moved back and forth, up and down, sideways, and every according to what was practical at the time. So you had people who were hunter-gatherers and also settled in communities, or you had people that went back to hunter-gathering after the agriculture failed, or vice versa, depending on, on the circumstances. And I wonder if that uh, comes into your calculation. I guess that's about it. Okay. That's enough, right? <laughs> okay, so let's go in reverse. Yes, so it literally does come into the calculation because I referenced that book. That that concept of a kind of, um, you know, you're nomadic for half the year and for the other half you live in a settled place, that's... Um, that is an interesting idea. It 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 clearly is the way some um, groups of people have done it, mm -hmm. and it could have been the way we all did it at some point. It could have been. My criticism of that is that we don't really know. I mean, what what is the reason to think that we had differing social orders? Um, yeah, as an entire species. For half the year and then for another i mean it, it it is possible i won't say that it isn't but i mean i just i i think it's a fascinating idea but they, i think that they 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 take it a little bit too far and as they argue about the possibility of it it sort of gradually becomes a certainty in in their view and i think that that's mm -hmm. uh, i think that that's too um uh imaginative but supposing they're right my view is still that it doesn't matter what your vision of human order is. We have always had one with the coming of civilization. There has always been some sense uh, as to how we fit into the environment around us and where that is and how we interact with one another. And obviously there are regional variations, there are seasonal variations of this, but there is no society that has n that has been without order because then mm -hmm. it would not be a society. And of course, this obviously refutes the kind of weird thought experiments of Rousseau and Hobbes. There, there, mm -hmm. has, never, there has never been a time when we were um, solitary. Right? We've always had some kind of social order. I think previously you said science. Um, so can you make a civilization from science. My answer is a, a, a almost unqualified no, mm -hmm. um, because, because it's, to put it crudely, in, in my view, it's civilization that makes science, not the other way around. And that science will never be able to create it might it might persuade you to, to create but it in and of itself it will not create the stability and the rootedness and the sense of history mm -hmm. that that gave us settled civilized life in the first place and as much as i like science and 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 technology for some reason science mm -hmm. and, it's always science and technology as though they're yeah but the they might not be actually the same thing but uh, science, science and technology, um, we have shown in the 20th century, are very apt to disrupt our sense of settledness and rootedness. And of course, um, some people liked that. The futurists loved that. The, the, the whole idea that you would sort of mm. be sort of abolishing yourself and your your uh, civilization as you sort of hurtled at full speed through time into the uh, fourth dimension. That's the way they talked. Mm -hmm. uh, and those are the people who became um, fascists, Nazis, and Bolsheviks. So I think that there's clearly something wrong with that mode of thought. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, you know, maybe in some kind of alternate universe that it would, wow. it might have worked out differently with yeah. slightly different ingredients. I don't know. 
I could say one thing. Uh, if you look at some of the work that's being done in the social sciences and also in neuroscience, we're beginning to find out things that make us do stuff that we uh, we never really systematize the same way, right? And this may change our education, our morals, um, our moral education for the better. It's possible. I, I won't say it's impossible, but um, the combination of two scientific ideas in the past produced two, two seemingly innocent ideas produced really quite catastrophic results. One was the theory of evolution. And, you know, the other was the idea of hygiene. Right. On their own, quite beneficial. And, and, and like, you know, the theory of evolution is one of the most successful ideas ever. Uh, right. It's been, um, vindicated not just as a as a, as basically a fact, but also as a way of looking at the past. Yeah. Uh, that that uh, uh, forms of life, um, you know, they they've gone from very simple to more complex, and and each one is sort of based on a uh, a previous one, and then hygiene, you know, the germ theory and so forth. It's done untold amount of good to uh, uh, alleviate human suffering and in many cases to eliminate it entirely but you put those two together and you have basically nazism from a from a certain perspective mm -hmm. right oh, eugenics <laughs> right and there's also a kind of um uh kind of a bolshevik soviet angle to that stuff too mm -hmm. so that's why I'm wary, you know, when people say things like, I know that this is a cliche at this point, but when people say things like, well, science says, like, well, I mean, come on, like, we can do better than this. You know, you, you, that's an excuse to sort of cease to think about anything. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and it has led down some very unpleasant roads uh, in the past. Right. Um, and not just, I mean, I say the past. I mean, this was this was like within Recent past, yeah. yeah. It was in the lifetime of my own grandparents. So yeah. it's like it's still sort of here. But uh what was your other question? I can't remember. I think David, you're oh, on the uh, I, I, it mostly comments at this point. Um yeah. But Sorry, I don't mentioning um, McClellan's yeah. comment. That would be about it. So, yeah. so, so we're running in overtime here. So yeah. I want to get a shot a question to uh, uh, an opportunity to ask his question, and then Sad will close and um, uh, to call an evening. Prashant. Uh hi. Um, a part of it was already reflected by Don, to be honest. So I don't think it will be much. <laughs> But um, it also comes from my master's project that I'm doing on digital data and cognitive liberty, which also reflects on how the information is biased, biased in R&D, which, as you said, has been prevalent throughout the years. And the way we feel the disruption right now with new technology or new ideologies coming in I'm pretty sure it would have been like that then as well, but we just view it as statistics, as data, and as events that have happened um, as a reflection of the past, right? And also, like like you said, there are gaps in how we recollect this data and remerge it, reconstruct it. It's not a fact. It These are events that have been generalized over the years and have been summarized mm -hmm. but the whole point of digital technology was that oh we will preserve the data and it will last for as long as possible it won't get destroyed but at the same time the problem still exists data is only getting recorded with a bias only and with an intent not uh it is not happening organically or we can't put anything that we want because of everything that that is there around ads and monetization as well 
um, in interactive form other than text. So my question is, if data is inherently biased and the system around it is around monetization, if in the future archivists would have to look at what was life like, if they see all of the media content that has been released, uh, would the history they create recreate be biased as well? And if it is, would they just accept it like, yeah, this was it. There was no other. Uh, so like things like indigenous communities and everything, while they are getting covered nowadays, it wasn't until a long time ago. And there may not be so much relevance in terms of that. Um, so does it, does it have to be in a way that, sorry, I am trying to form the question. Would, would data be, uh, would data misinform us because right now it is doing that to us mm. in a way especially with the auto-generated AI responses, which are at times faulty and we still take it at face value and be like, yeah, it's true. What gives it? So would that happen more in the future or would we learn from this and try to build resilience around it in a way? Well, that is a very good question. And I think it's very unfortunate that our culture talks on the one hand so much about the idea of sort of digitizing things and preserving them forever and yet has such a i would say such a low regard for the truth um in the sense that postmodernist thought has been almost entirely triumphant especially within the humanities but i think now we can see it creeping sort of elsewhere with the sort of two plus two equals five crowd and the um, the idea that, you know, even um, uh, what I would call sort of uh, objective uh, mathematical knowledge is still entirely conditioned by power, which I find like a kind of silly idea, but uh, it's nevertheless prevalent. Um, so, it seems as though there's a there's a an obvious contradiction in the sense that data will just sort of speak for itself, and and yet all truth is relative and and um, knowledge is conditioned by power. Well, again, this is obviously false in the sense that the people who make um, <laughs> the people who make rockets and satellites go up into the air clearly have some sense of like what is it? objectively true and like what is actual um knowledge facts and 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 um um observable like objective uh ph phenomena like if they if they didn't nothing they did would succeed right so uh again the the vision of of things that speak for themselves and uh knowledge that is conditioned by power and the relativity of truth like this is this is all just unsustainable contradictions and you know we are going to have to sort of push through this as a as a people as a as a civilization and um hopefully when we come out on the other side of it we will have vanquished uh postmodernist conceits about um ab ab about the world and that we will hopefully also discover that the sort of the lesser claims that postmodernism makes for itself do have an element of truth to them, that you do need to understand contexts and and uh, um, um, you know uh, small what they call like the smaller narratives micro narratives of, about the world if you're going to get a full sense of um, how things are um not at the very least 
future generations are going to want to know why we chose to preserve what we chose to preserve. What does it tell us? What does it tell them about us? And I'll give you an interesting fact. This is not like digitization, but it's similar. Um, there, there were several broadcasts for years and years and years in America, um, news broadcasts, uh, television shows, you know, sort of daily programming. None of it was recorded and preserved at all, except apparently by one uh, lady, I forget where she lived, but she, she had a VCR and she just recorded everything round the clock. And then this got sent off. Eventually it was discovered somehow and then sent off to um, libraries. But if you had missed the nightly news or whatever, that would be it. You, like, it would just, it was just gone. Nobody thought to preserve it at all. And um, you think about that and you think, like, why on earth would that have been anyone's attitude to anything? Like the 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 aberration is not that the lady was recording things, because that's I think a normal human impulse. It was the fact that wealthy studios and 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 um, um, broadcasters didn't think for a moment that what they had produced was worth recording, worth worth preserving. And if you want to know where I found this out, it's in a book called The Nineties. Um, by it's the same guy who wrote the book Generation X, but I, I forget his name. Um, but it'll come to me anyway. If you want that, that whole anecdote is is explored very deeply um, in in that book. And um, anyway, when it comes to digitization, I'm of two minds about it. I think it's it's really peculiar what you will find on things like archive.org. Um, I have found that a lot of very ancient texts and, and, and not just the ancient texts, but also very old editions of them, sometimes even 16th, 17th century editions of, of, of Greek texts or 19th century ones, you will find someone has taken the trouble to scan them and put them on archive.org. Why did they choose those really old versions of them? I don't know. but you know, they, they did, they don't have any more modern ones. Um, maybe that says something about the condition in which they found them. Um, if so, that would raise questions about why libraries allow books to deteriorate so rapidly. Um, but the you raised the point about the idea that uh, digital archivists think that they're preserving things forever. I'm very doubtful about that because a lot of things that were held on the internet um, in the 90s or early 2000s, they're just gone. Or they've been preserved only in a kind of fragmentary way on the Wayback Machine. Um, I don't think anybody foresaw that. They thought the internet was forever and there's that expression, the internet's forever, which is not actually true. So, um, how long are these things going to last? And supposing they're all held in the cloud somewhere or in a data center, well, they're all like, you have potentially millions, maybe even billions of things that are all held in one center. If that one thing goes down, then that's the end of millions of things. That would be very different from say, one medieval scriptorium burning down. Right, you would lose much less in in that because there would be redundancies elsewhere. I don't know whether that's the case with digital archiving, but I doubt it. So, so uh, Zad, do you want to uh, ask the last question? And... Sure, yeah. So this will be the closer question, Dr. Bonner, and it'll be a little bit of a challenge round because we'll see, see if you can answer it briefly, which oh. makes it more interesting. Um, and I don't have time to uh, expand on it. So there are a lot of assumptions uh, you'll see are going to be baked into it. But this is this is kind of a fun closer. And this wasn't planned, but you saw the way the last few questions came up. They were asking you questions about the future. They're asking you questions about what potentially you might know. So let's say that 
in the climate we live in today, there's a preoccupation with a sense of short-termism urgency. And if historians are the custodians and the gatherers of long-form knowledge that can influence a wider horizon of decision-making, in real terms, what does it take to actually have a historian influence uh, decision-making, decision-making that matters? Oh my. Uh, <laughs> so um, Polybius says that the writing of history will never be good unless um, men of action and who have experience in political life do it. But you're asking the reverse. It's basically, how do you get a historian to uh, influence um, political life? And I, I, I don't know. I mean, you would need a, a fundamental cultural shift. I don't think that we have a tradition in the West of, uh, say, you know, civil servants having, having to show that they um, have memorized all the Chinese classics. Uh, and that they, they are sort of deeply versed in Confucian um, thought. Uh, I don't think we've ever had anything like that, but that, that, that at the very least is a symbol of a connection with history, uh, a, 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 as well as a kind of common culture, to uh, a, a culture common uh, amongst bureaucrats and, 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 and politicians. Um, I want to say that part of the solution must be what um, you would call localism. People will take a longer view when they're when they have skin in the game, um, as uh, Nassim Taleb would remind us. And that if you could dial down the abstractions of sort of national and international politics down to a level where you know, you're actually immediately affected by it. I think then you take, um, then you take a much longer view, looking both to the past as you would try to find institutional or, or uh, I want to say institutional knowledge, but the, the kind of knowledge that older people who live in a community would have. It's not quite the same thing, but it's similar. And, you know, some sense of obligation to your ancestors and to your children. You know, you find that at a smaller level of politics, at a, at a, at a local level, rather than a much higher, larger, abstract view. That's where I would start. Um, but um, getting people to snap out of the, the, the short-term thinking, I mean, that's going to take... That's that's going to take. I, I want to say a revolution. No, it's more like a counter revolution. <laughs> persuade pers persuade people to sort of slow down and and look backward. But um, you know, I, I'm I'm optimistic that I'm I'm optimistic that it may happen. I mean, the the sort of the globalization of the '90s um, uh, sort of persuaded people to ignore, in many cases their uh their smaller local communities in favor of um other concerns but uh, i'd like to think that people are sort of shifting back now. nice that's beautiful in some ways there's an undercurrent of a theme of looking inwards yet again and perhaps that that is a a wider theme that connects to a lot of aspects of revolutionary thinking today well let's hope so <laughs> Um, I have to say thank you so much, Dr. Bonner. I think this was like a wonderful discussion. A bunch of us are still on now. I think that's a testament to how engaged we were in the conversation. We'll definitely have to even continue perhaps part two uh, in the new year sometime and, and do this again. It was very kind of you and generous of you to invite me. And I'm sorry to have pontificated for so long. No problem at all. So I think for systems thinkers here, uh, in December, we don't, we usually take that month off, correct, David? That's right. And then we'll be back in January. So yeah, thank you very much, everyone. Have a wonderful end of the year. Thank you again, Dr. Bonner, for joining us tonight and hope everyone has a great night. Thank okay. you. Take care, everyone. Bye.